Hi there. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk about how to create a scene something like this. But the main thrust of this is how to deal with the fact that a scene like this has an awful lot of complexity in it. Now, for a still scene, there are some very simple things that you can do. But for an animated scene, that becomes more complex. But now that we've got geometry nodes, we can deal with it actually in a fairly straightforward way. If you enjoy these tutorials, don't forget to click like and subscribe. Feel free to comment or ask questions or even dislike the video. And if you don't like the video, I'd be very interested to see what the issues you spotted were so that I can improve going forward. If you're a Patreon supporter, I do upload these files for any use available to my Patreon supporters. And I upload tutorials quite regularly. So let's start the tutorial. So to begin with, let's just create the basic scene. I'm not going to cover every single element in the scene because that would be quite a long tutorial, but I will cover just the basics to give you a starter on it. For my Patreon supporters, I will upload the original file with all the assets and everything in it to make it a lot easier. So to begin with, we're just going to add a simple plane and we're going to scale that up a bit and then we're going to subdivide it. So I've gone into edit mode and I'm going to say subdivide and I can click this little point down here. And I'll just add a few subdivisions initially. And then I'm going to right click and say subdivide again. But this time I'm going to add fractal. And by doing that, I'm sort of limiting the amount of variation I'm getting. Increasing the fractal amount just gives us this random up and down motion, which gives us a slightly more interesting and realistic landscape. And I think I'll add another subdivision there, maybe decrease the fractal slightly and then subdivide again and I'll just put a much lower fractal on that. And then we'll come out of edit mode, control 2 just to add a subdivision surface and smooth it out a bit. I'm going to scale it down slightly on the Z just to control the amount of offset. Then I'm going to look from above in edit mode, unselect everything, then press C and I just wanted sort of waterways going through. It's sort of like a, a marsh or something like that. And some of them will obviously be wider than others. So I'm going to press O to turn on proportional editing and then scale Z. And basically sort of flattening out what will be the water areas. And then G, Z, just drag that down. And I can increase or decrease how much of a bank I'm creating there. We'll go with that. And I'll turn proportional editing off now and then scale Z zero just to flatten it off completely at the bottom of the water as it were. I think we'll go down slightly and I've got proportional editing off there. So that's given me a waterway. We'll give the landscape just a basic material and we'll just make it a sort of dark brown colour. Obviously you need to do a more complex material depending on the kind of light that you've got. In my scene it was very dark and I've added that to the viewport display as well and set that to shade smooth. And now I'll add another plane, scale it up to about the size of the original one. And this one's going to stay flat. We don't need to subdivide this one. And then just move it down, really just to represent the water. And we'll give this one, just to make it easy to recognize, a bluish color in the viewport. I did an animated material on the water, and I will just briefly show how to do that. So I've already got a light in the scene, and as it happens, I've also got quite a few assets over here. So they're created in various ways. The trees are created with the tree generator. I've shown how to do that a number of times. And then I've got some plants that I created, and these down here are ferns and things like that. And then over here, I've got some bulrushes and some grasses and things like that. This is actually the trees and these are the main things that I'm going to use. I don't think I ended up using these for the demonstration. So let's open another window up. And I've also got a light in the scene, a lamp. Because I was going to do a very foggy scene, I didn't use a sun lamp. I just used a point light. And we'll put that over here somewhere. And you can see it's quite a bright lamp. I experimented with doing this in cycles, but I found EV was good enough. And cycles obviously would take longer to render. So if we have a look at the rendered view, as this is EV, you can see we've got quite a bright if rather localized lamp there but I'll make sure it's behind the landscape. I'm going to hide my plants and things for the moment just so they don't slow everything down. They've got a lot of detail in them. So for this window up here we'll go to the shader editor make sure we've got the water selected and because of the sort of scene I was doing I actually colored the water black. It sort of gave me the best effect for what I was trying to achieve. Roughness I set almost zero so 
very shiny, but not completely. So I set that to 0.025. I'll go back to rendered view. You can see we've got some reflections there now. And although it didn't matter too much, I put the index of refraction to that of water, which is 1.33. So then we need to just do something with the surface of the water. I'm going to add under input texture coordinate node. There are shortcuts for adding some of these. Then I'm going to add under vector a mapping node. And I took generated into the vector input on there. I then added under texture, a noise texture and take the output from the mapping node into there and then add under vector a bump node. You can search for these, of course, by just using the search option. The noise texture then goes into height. You can use factor or color. It doesn't matter too much into the height on the bump node. And then the output of the bump node goes into the normal on the principal shader. And you can see something's changed down here. It takes a moment to update itself. And you can see we've got what appears to be huge ripples on the surface there. So I'll just set it to somewhere around the values I used. And that may be a good starting point. So we'll set the scale to 70. See, that's a lot higher. I'll put the detail up to 15. You can actually go higher by typing the number in. I'll set the distortion up to 0.2. The distortion gives you sort of wavy effects and I felt that was appropriate. The strength is way too high at the moment. So we'll set that to 0.12. And now you can see we've got sort of ripples in the surface. Now this is going to be an animation and they're obviously static at the moment. So we need to change this a little bit. And that's what this mapping node is all about. I'm going to add under converter a combined XYZ node. And the reason for that is because the value I'm going to use next will just be a single numeric value. I've added a combined XYZ node and the reason for adding it is to make it easier to try different axes to see which works best. And that is going to go into location. You may find it works even on rotation. Scale will probably not work so well. And then I'm going to add an input, which is simply a value input. And I ended up putting it into Z. At the moment, that's not going to do anything. But if I put the frame value in here, if I type hash frame and press return, you can see that's now saying one. If I put this to the end frame of the animation, that's now saying 300, which is the last frame in my animation. And you'll notice things have moved in there. So if I go back to the beginning and press play, you can see something's changing. Obviously going much too fast. Basically, this is replicating the frame number. So I need to do a little bit of math with that and divide it. So let's divide it by a thousand. So it will change much more slowly now and have a look at that. That's what I used in my original animation. It's probably still a little bit fast, depending on the scale that you're trying to represent with the water. So let's put it at 2000 and see how that looks. And that's not too bad at all. That's giving a quite good impression of water. If you want it to be even more languid water, then maybe you could even put it higher. So put it up at 4000, for example. And there. So I think that really gives quite a good impression for a very simple effect of moving water. And you can change the strength up here and so on. So that's all I did for the water. And now we need to create a geometry node system to add some plants to the landscape. So we'll come out of that view and we'll select the land. Now, one of the problems is it's just going to create the plants everywhere at the moment. So in anticipation of that, I'm going to tell Blender where most of the plants anyway should grow and where they shouldn't. If I go to wireframe mode, you can see we've still got the water selected, so that's handy. But what I'm going to do now is say select invert. We've now got just the landscape selected. And this is why I needed a reasonable number of vertices. You may find you need even more than that just to get a nice smooth shape on the edge of the water. I'm going to just increase that one there slightly. And then we'll come over to here, data properties for the landscape in edit mode. We'll click plus and we'll call that trees area and assign that. So if we double click A to deselect everything and then just click select here, you can see we've got that again. Now, I actually did a couple of different ones because I wanted some of the marginal plants, for example, to be a little bit into the water. So what I did there was with the initial area selected, control plus just to add a little bit more and then just click deselect for that. You can now see we've got just the marginal area and then you can click plus and put marginal area and assign that. So now we've got the marginal area there and the tree area there. So we've got two vertex groups defined. So we'll go up to here and we'll go to the geometry node editor. I'm just going to bring up the modifiers here. We've still got a subdivision surface on there. I'm going to apply the subdivision surface. I think it'll just get it out the way and it also gives me some more vertices to play with. One of the challenges with this 
type of scene is that there are going to be a lot of vertices in it, as you will see, because we're instancing lots of high poly objects and that's going to start to cause Blender some problems and I did work out a way to manage that a little bit, make it more manageable anyway. But let's first make our geometry node system. Now, as I said, I've already got my assets in here. So if I open this one up, you can see I've got grasses all in one particular group. You can just select the objects, press M and say new collection, and that will collect them together. And that's what we want to do because obviously I want a collection of objects. So I've got a collection of grass here, rushes and trees. So we'll start with the trees and I'll say, I'll make sure I've got my ground selected. I'll just name it up here and we'll say new geometry node and we'll call this trees unsurprisingly. So I'll move these apart a bit. I'm going to add, first of all, under geometry, a join geometry node. You often want to do this because I want to be able to see this geometry. If I didn't have this, the geometry itself, the plane would disappear when I start plugging other nodes in. So next I need to tell it to start to create some points on which I'm gonna instance some trees. If I go up to here, under points, I can distribute points on faces. So I'll just put that there, take the geometry into one side and the output into there for the time being. And you can see it's just created these blobs. It's just point. And how many it creates is based on that density. I'm gonna keep that quite low at the moment. And where they're distributed is affected by the seed. So we obviously want it to create trees, not just little blobs like that. I then need to add under instances, instance on points, and we'll drop that there. It's vanished because it doesn't know what to instance yet. Instancing is sort of creating an object. So I'm now going to come over to here and I'm going to grab my trees collection and just drop it there. And you can see I've now got a collection because I don't want it to create an instance containing all of the trees in one go. I need to say separate children. And because I want them to each have their own origin point rather than share the origin point of the original collection, I also need to say reset children and then take that instances and unsurprisingly plug it into the instance point there. And immediately you can see we've got some huge trees being generated. So just to make things a little more visible, let's try scaling them down a bit. So now we've got some trees, but they're all the same tree, even though there's lots of different trees in my collection. And what we need to do is just click in here and say, pick instance. And now you can see it's picking all sorts of different trees. We've still got some issues. They're all the same size and they're also growing in the water in some cases. So at this point, we need to connect up that vertex group we created to define where the trees are to the density of our points. So I'm just gonna take density and plug it into that spare node there. And if we come over to here, you can see we've got some new options, particularly under group. This is the group input. So under group tab here, we've got now got a density option. And you can see here it is, on the geometry node under the modifiers. It's just got a number in at the moment, which is the density of the trees. So I'm gonna click the little flag symbol here, click in here, and you notice we've got a trees area. If it doesn't show up, just start typing the name of the vertex group and it should. Now, we've only got a couple of trees because this is really a one or zero type of option. So what I also now need to do is multiply that to increase the density. So I'm gonna add under utilities, math node and just drop that in there and we'll set it to multiply and I'm going to take another connection to there. This one's just defaulted to the name value and we'll call this density multiplier with tree on the end just so we know which one it was. So now we've got a number which we can use to actually increase the number of trees but it's still paying attention to where the trees aren't supposed to be growing. We've got one right on the edge there. So if we didn't like that what we can do is come back to the vertex groups. If we say select day you can see that's probably going a bit too low into the water. So if I don't want that tree there, I can just select a bit of landscape just there and then say remove. And you can see that tree has vanished already. And now we can happily go back to the modifiers and increase our tree density a little. So fine, we've now managed to get something which for the most part doesn't put trees where we don't want them. Let's see, we've got some there, but obviously they're all the same size, possibly a little too small. So we'll add under utilities, a random value node and we'll plug that random value into scale. Obviously that's too big. That's creating a random number between naught and one and one is clearly way too large. We don't necessarily want any trees that are zero size, but we'll put the max value at something like 0.05 maybe, but we'll put the min value at 0.005, something like that. And I think that max value 
still too big. So now we've got some small bushes scaling up to larger trees. And again, we can do something similar with a multiply node. Take that out to their tree size. And what this will do is affect the size of all trees, whatever starting size they are. I could just take the individual numbers here out, but then I'd be just adjusting either the smallest size to the largest size, which you might want to do. But by taking that out, I can now tweak the value for all my trees. So if they're all too big or all too small, and you can keep going like this. And then one other thing we need to do is they're all oriented. So trees of the same type or essentially the same tree model even if they're different sizes and in different positions, are instancing in the same orientation. Now we want the vertical orientation to stay the same, but we want them to rotate on the vertical axis. So I'm going to add under utilities vector combine X, Y, Z, and I'm going to take that into rotation. I'm going to take another random value node and I'm going to plug that into Z and then just put a really big number on the max number. Min number doesn't matter too much. And now what I've got is trees that are orienting in a random way. And you can play with the C just to get different ones. I'll just bring my camera around and I think we can have those trees a little larger. It's fine for some of them to be off the top. And of course we might want to take the seed out as well, but I'll just play with the C just to get some trees in some different positions. So that's starting to add some complexity. I'm going to increase the tree density a bit. We'll go up to 35. Blender's handling that fine at the moment. So I'm just going to turn off the visibility in the viewport for that geometry node system and add another one. So that's a duplicate of the first one. We'll just rename that first one trees and we'll call this one marginals. So this is essentially a, just a copy of the first one at the moment. We'll make it visible again. You can see it's instancing trees at the moment, but I'm going to change this and we'll change that to rushes. So a bit on the large side, but nevertheless, there they are. Obviously the names of all these groups needs to change. We'll just change this to rushes up here. So we'll have a look through the camera. Not too bad, but I think they are a little too big. So we'll just reduce those a little. And let's put the density up to 100 and see what that starts to look like. Now, at the moment, of course, they're all over the landscape. And really, they need to be marginals. So rather than the trees area in here, we'll select the marginal area. Now you can see they're possibly a little more appropriately placed. And we'll go up to a higher density still. And now we can bring our trees back. And what I forgot to do was to make this unique. So you can see there's a little number here. So I need to click that number, then go back to my trees. That's a common mistake. It'd be good if Blender had a little warning about that when you did that sort of thing. So I'll change this one before I change it. I'm going to set the density back to, I think we had it at about 25. And we'll change that name back to trees. And of course, all of these are misnamed now. So we've got our marginals there and we just need to set these back to trees. And I think we'll make those trees larger again, because I think we shrank them. And perhaps we'll just change the seed a bit. It's a bit better. So we're starting to get quite a lot of geometry in the scene now. We've got over three and a half million vertices in the scene. We can't see too much yet because we haven't got any mist and the mist will actually help to illuminate the scene in a way, but it's starting to take shape. So right now I select my camera. There is my camera. And let's say I move my camera over the course of the scene. We'll press I to select location and rotation there. And then we'll go to the end of the 300 frames that we've got for our scene. We'll put the camera there and maybe rotate it to there. So if I look through the camera now, What I might want to do is perhaps set that to interpolation mode linear. Probably going faster than I'd like, but nevertheless. And I would generally try not to see the edge of the land there. But what you can see is there's a lot of landscape out here that I don't need to render. Now, the typical way to deal with that for a still scene is to go back to our vertex groups for the landscape and I'll just go to the geometry nodes and just turn those visibility of those off for a moment. Go to edit mode, make sure nothing's selected and we're looking wireframe and then we look through the camera and I can just select some of the land to just outside the camera's view. So this is the an area which I could click in here and assign it. This is the area that I would want things to be rendered for a still scene. So if I come up here, you can see it's a cone shape leading away from the camera. So I could use that group and have that as one of the inputs to perhaps another multiply node 
that would control the density of my trees. However, because this is an animation, that's not going to work because obviously I want to be able to move my camera around. And even if it isn't an animation, I may well want to try different views from my camera. So I need to do something which allows me to dynamically change what is rendered. So to do that, the first thing I'm going to do, and you can do this in several different ways, but I'm just going to add a cube and I'm going to put that somewhere in front of the camera. It's actually easier to start off with if the camera is not at a funny angle, but it doesn't matter too much. I'm just going to angle it roughly in alignment with the camera and roughly the same height as the camera. It doesn't matter too much. We're not going to see this. My cubes ended up over here, so I'm just going to take it out of there. And I call it something like proxy cube. The reason for that name will become clear shortly. I'm just going to center its origin roughly in the view of the camera. And I want these points just slightly outside the view of the camera. I'm going to go into edit mode and I'm just going to select that back face. And I'm just going to take that to just beyond the edge of the landscape, roughly in a straight line away from the camera. And then I'm going to say scale shift Z so it will not scale on the Z axis outward like that. And I'm going to look through the camera and what I want to see is that the far distant face that's selected is wider than the camera and the camera view in the horizontal axis. Vertical doesn't matter so much. The technique we're going to use is that we're going to detect where the camera can see by the use of this kind of cone. So I need this cone to be effectively glued to the camera. So I'm going to I've got the cone selected. I'm now going to select camera itself, control P and say object. And now as the camera moves and rotates, this cone shape does as well. Now, one of the things about the way this technique works is it uses faces. So it doesn't use the volume of this object. It uses the faces of it. So it needs to be of a thickness that will essentially mean that there is a face close to the lowest points in the landscape and a face close to the highest points. If you've got really up and downy sort of landscape, you may be better off by creating a shape with lots of stacked planes that is also just a single object. So, for example, I could just delete the side faces here and add new faces down it. But I found with a bit of playing around, this worked, certainly for the majority of use cases. Just bear in mind, this is now glued to my camera and I need this to be sort of close to the landscape that I want to affect. I'm actually going to select that face and just move it up a little bit. And now I'm going to come over to here and under visibility, I want it to be visible in viewports, but not in renders. And I'm just going to say, just render it as wireframe so that I can see where it is, but I can see what's underneath it as well. So I've now got an object which defines where I want particles to appear. So I'm going to go back to my ground now, my ground geometry node systems. We'll select our trees and I'm going to drag my proxy cube straight into that geometry node. So now a bit like the collection, we've got an object info for that cube. And it's important to click relative. If you don't do that, things don't work quite right. And then I'm going to add, we'll search for it. If we type in proxy, we can get geometry proximity. So it's essentially detecting how close some geometry is. Take geometry output from that proxy cube and put it into the target. See it set to faces. It'd be good if we had volume at one point, but the way I did it. I also then, in order to control how it worked, I added under utilities, I added, we'll just search for it, a color ramp. And I took the distance option out of there into the input on my color ramp and then I set my color ramp to constant. So even though the first point is black and the second point is white, it essentially stays black for all of here until it gets close to the end and then it suddenly turns white because I don't want to fade in objects. I don't want the density of things slowly ramping up as they are enclosed by this object. I want them to either be there or not be there. I don't want them there at all outside of this object. So that's why I'm using constant which is, means it's either black or white. Now we need to add a map range node. And we'll take color output into there. This is going to go into the bottom input, which is currently for multiplier on the density of the trees. And you can see we've got a couple of trees, but it's not quite right yet. And to be able to still control the density of the trees, we're going to take the density multiplier for the trees to the max value on this map range node. 
you can see we've got our trees back. However, in terms of where the trees are rendered, they're all over the place still. But if we start to turn this down, you can see the trees are disappearing. When we get close to the bottom, the only place the trees are really being rendered is where that proxy cube is. So if I now animate it, what you can see is as the trees go outside of what is essentially the field of view of the camera, they're disappearing. And as they come into it, they appear. You can see some trees appearing up here. So we can have a look through the camera. And what we don't want to see is anything appearing while it's visible within this area or disappearing for that matter. Hard to see it when it's very real time. But you can see there's a tree here appearing and disappearing. If I turn this off for a minute, it might be easy to see. But it's well outside the view of the camera. Now, strictly, things like sh if you had strong shadows coming across the scene, that sort of thing, that it would be visible. Now, you can make this proximity cube bigger in the horizontal axis in order to help deal with that. But this is really a fix for the limitations of Blender when it comes to, or, or any other tool for that matter, when it comes to rendering. So it's just a way of optimizing it. And it will mean that your renders will run a little more quickly. So you can see there, we've actually got a tree appearing and disappearing while it's in the scene. So what we would want to do to deal with that is just slightly widen our cube, certainly at more distant ends. So if I select that face there, say scale shift Z, and just make that a little wider, that should mean that that tree doesn't vanish too early and doesn't appear too late. The other thing you may need to do is adjust the height or vertical position, because as I said to you, if I lower it too much, all my trees disappear. If I lift it too high, they disappear. Unfortunately, it doesn't use the volume. There's no way to make it use the volume currently. But if you're having a lot of difficulty because your landscape's very up and down, you can have multiple objects, for example, a lot of planes. You can also adjust this point a little bit to adjust sensitivity. You can see the trees are hanging on a little bit longer now before they disappear or appear for that matter. So if you are following along to try to make your own render, we obviously would then need to just copy this little piece with its map range and paste that into our other geometry node system. Drop that in there and take that to there. And then we can turn our rushes on as well. And we should see as the camera moves, the rushes appear and disappear. And you can see it's taking a bit of time because that's quite a lot of geometry now. But in terms of rendering, it's only having to render that visible cone. So just the last little thing, if you are going to render this as a scene for yourself, and obviously this would slow it down as well, I'm just going to turn off the viewport visibility for those objects. And then I'm going to scale up this cube. We're going to call that mist. We're going to go to the shader editor and say new. And again, I wanted sort of slight drifting effect in the mist. So it's a slightly more complicated setup than normal. We'll get rid of the principled VSDF. You can use the principled volumetric. I just used volume scatter because that's all I really needed. Obviously, that needs to go into the volume input. And I set the anisotropy to 0.9. So if you have the density down a bit, you can obviously start to see a light. Make sure the color is fully bright. And then I'm going to add texture coordinate node. This is so that I can animate it. I'm going to add a mapping node. We use generated into the vector input. This may look familiar because I've used it once already today. I'm going to add under converter a combined XYZ node. That's plugged into location on the mapping node. And again, I'm going to add an input, which is value. And I used hash frame divided by a thousand. And one of the good things of doing things like this is that you can vary the length of your animation and this will still take account of it. And I ended up affecting X for this one. So what are we affecting? We need to add a little bit more in here. So I'm going to add color ramp node and under textures, a noise texture. The noise texture is going to have a vector input from that mapping node. I used a scale of about seven, max detail, and again, a little bit of distortion. Factor output goes into the color ramp. I left the color ramp on linear, but brought these two points in a little bit just to make the contrast between dense mist and less dense mist 
more significant. And then just so that I could control overall more easily the difference between dense and non-dense mist, although you could do it with the color ramp, I just added a map range node, just an easier way to do it. Color output into the input there, and then I set the max to 0.025, and then the output of that into the density for my volume scatter. So you can see there, there's variation in the mist. And if I now turn on the geometry node systems, and this is EV of course, so we do, there are some settings we need to adjust up here. We need to make sure screen space reflections are on because we'll lose our reflections on the water if we don't have that. I used Bloom just to add something to it. And we need volumetrics. If that's not on, you're obviously not gonna get any of that. So I turn volumetrics for both shadows and lighting on. And I set the tile size to two, which is the smallest. Slows it down again, but means you may get some god rays when there's a tree. So there you can see them just about there showing. Could even put the samples up a little bit more. So that's basically all there is to it. I will, as I say, upload the source file for my patrons to use, and that will contain all the assets that I've used in this, plus some extra ones. So you may find those useful in some nature scenes you're creating. Otherwise, I will see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot. <laughs>